Hello again, this is Mark Mitchell. I wanted to take a few minutes of your time today to uh, help with a, a video on some of the upcoming items that will be on uh, our exam, our second exam. The second exam covers chapters 5 through 8. It was a little lengthier than some of the others, but I wanted to uh, at least go over some questions that I thought would be helpful, and again, in preparation for the upcoming exam. So, uh, I've got some questions here, and let's look at these again. Our quizzes and exams are multiple choice, so you have to decide from four answer options, and uh, my advice to everybody is to make sure that you are reading and doing all your assignments in uh, some type of study method. The more practice you have with this material, then uh, the exams and quizzes uh, will be less difficult for you. So, number one from Michael Focal's distinctive perspective of power people A are coerced by centralized power B willingly self-regulate to conform C are vulnerable to persuasion or D resist coercive authority so I'll give you just a minute to look over those read them to yourself and then uh, think of an answer again a lot of these uh, are, are directly coming from the textbook and this one was here too there was a a little article there about different types of punishment and what was effective. You might remember the illustration that was used of a man who tried to kill the king and the torture that they put him through. That's uh, where it was in the in the textbook. But the um, the answer, the best answer to number one is B: willingly self-regulate to conform. Number two: the most effective way to resist power for those who are weak and low in status, power, and resources is. A, collective disobedience, demonstration of revolt, indirect confrontation or education. So again, after uh, you've read this for yourself, just try to think. Uh, for those who resist power, what's their best way to do that? And it would be A, collective disobedience. Number three, long-term hostages tend to identify with their captor's point of view over time and voluntarily comply with their demands. This phenomenon is called, or is known as, A, the Stockholm Syndrome, B, the Prisoner's Dilemma, C, Going Native, or D, the Belgian Illusion. So, um, again, this one to me is by far uh, one that highlights the importance of reading and making sure that you're aware of things in the textbook and you can do that through your Learn Smarts or other assignments as well. But uh, the best answer by far is A, the Stockholm Syndrome. And if you're old enough, you that may be another way to remember. But if you're, if you're younger, then uh, you don't remember those events. <clears throat> Number four, which system accomplishes the least inequality? And uh, by this, they mean economic inequality. So how people... Uh, are different in the amount of resources that they have. So is it A, democratic socialism, B, state socialism, C, capitalism, or D, communism? And so again, according to the book, uh, if you have read, now they, of course, mean uh, the least inequality in a good way, that people have what they need, but uh, everybody really, there's no uh, real big differences of those with a lot versus those without a lot. But the book indicates A, democratic socialism. And I guess if you wanted to say the least inequality but with people suffering, that would be communism. But that's, that's not what the book is, is looking at. Number five, kids often play dress up or play school as a form of A, resocialization, anticipatory socialization, C, role modeling, or D, imitation. So this one I think so far the ones we've looked at is maybe a little more difficult. Uh, there definitely seems to be a couple answers that stand out. And again, I'll give you a moment to read and think. But uh, to me, definitely, you know, B stands out. And then there's also, you know, something maybe about D that stands out. Some may also find uh, C appealing. And these, you know, all make sense. Uh, they seem to be right on target. But the, the one best answer that we're looking for in number five is anticipatory socialization. So that would be correct. Number six, what is the most common life course pattern for men in the United States today? Again, this is a question that comes directly from the textbook. Um, 
Number six, you know, we could uh, just change one word and put women instead of men, and uh, we would have a completely different answer according to the, the textbook. But your answer options are work, marriage, parenthood, and A, B, college, work, and marriage, C, college, work, cohabitation, or D, is it work, parenthood, and cohabitation? For men, what is their life course pattern in the U.S. today? The answer to number six is A, work, marriage, parenthood. And of course, if we added in uh, women, then we would have to add, un add unemployment because of their parenthood. So that's really the big difference between men and women. Seven, what percentage of women over 65 live alone? Is A, 52%, B, 32%, C, 39%, and D, 43%. This one's a little difficult because it is very specific in nature. And it's hard to remember the numbers, and especially uh, three of them are pretty close. Um, so there's not much, uh, too much variation in these numbers. So this one would be hard to know. Um, seven, the correct answer is B, 32%. So nearly a third of women 65 and up live alone. Uh, number eight, what is the three-step process that Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman believe individuals go through as they construct reality, as they make reality for themselves? Is it A, externalization, objectivation, internalization? Is it B, internalization, externalization, or objectivation? Is it C, embodiment, objecting, internalizing? Or D, defining, believing, and constructing? And so right off the bat, uh, again, when you have read, you realize that C and D are completely wrong. And then that just leaves a choice between A and B. And actually, A is, is correct here. Externalization, objectivation, and internalization. Those were the three uh, steps that Berger and Luckman describe in our textbook. Number nine, according to Emil Durkheim's definition, an act is deviant or criminal because A is essentially wrong by any standard, B offends social norms, C is inherently immoral, or D is illegal. According to Durkheim, an act is deviant or criminal because which of the following is correct? And Durkheim would state for us that he believes B, it offends social norms, is actually the why that an act is a behavior is called deviant or criminal. Number 10, according to Elijah Anderson's research, The Code of the Street, referring to his article, it defines life in poor neighborhoods. What does he mean by this term, code of the street? Again, in his article that uh, is by the, known by the same name, and there's, of course, some videos you can watch as well on the Internet if you go to YouTube. Uh, is it A, an unstructured community? B, an alternative social structure? C, a dysfunctional community? Or D, a crime-ridden environment? But Anderson goes on to say, by code of the street, he talks about how uh, these street and decent families are different in how they view things and how they uh, raise their children and, and so forth. But uh, B, an alternative social structure, would be the correct answer. Uh, they were quite different from the decent parents, uh, the, the street parents from the decent parents is how he labeled it. Number 11, an onlooker who rushes into a burning building despite the danger is demonstrating what type of behavior? Is it positive deviance, B, deviance, C, conformist behavior, or D, overconformity? So uh, again, give you just a moment to think of your answer. I'm sure, again, there may be some that stand out to you you think are better options than the others, but uh, for us, the correct answer in number 11 would be positive deviance. All right, and uh, we'll talk some more about that in the, in the textbook uh, when we come to that section. And finally, uh, the last one I had today, number 12, from the functionalist perspective, self-policing is A, necessary for both the individual and society, B, limiting freedom in society, oppressive, oppressive of individuals, or D, not necessary to preserve order. Self-policing is which of the following, A, B, C, or D? And the best alternative for uh, number 12 is it is necessary for both the individual and society. So I think we've had kind of 
two questions today that really revolved around batting, if you count the one Michael Focal and that was here earlier. I did want to, to give you this video here um, because, our again, the exam was a little longer, and I thought uh, this might be of help in studying and getting ready and doing the, the best that you can. But uh, if you have any questions individually, uh, you know, please ask or come by during office hours, and I'll be glad to help you. Thank you, and have a good day.